This week, I'll compile Debian Bullseye on my Pinebook Pro with the desktop environment chosen by viewers. I've also got my hands on the new Eagle Moss die-cast model of the Orville, and I'll crack into the box and get a first look at our favorite Union vessel. Becca's here with the top news stories we're following, including NVIDIA's acquisition of ARM, Microsoft's underwater data center, and an AI that'll kick your butt in Gran Turismo Sport. Crypto correspondent Robert Koenig is here to help us understand what impermanent loss means as we learn more about investing in the cryptocurrency market. Don't miss a moment. It's time for the tech. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid-state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Well, welcome to the show. It's so nice to have you here. My name is Robbie Ferguson, and I'm the host of Category 5 Technology TV. Have done for, oh, let's figure, uh, carry the one, 13 years. 13 years. This, my friends, is the end of season 13. Can you believe that lucky number 13, which has been filled with no problems, has been just a perfect year all around that has finally come to an end. Our next broadcast will be season 14. So do get involved in our community. Make sure you subscribe to us on uh, on YouTube in particular. Make sure you click that bell so you get the notifications anytime we post anything. But also get involved in our community. So that means getting onto our Discord server, getting into IRC if you're more into that kind of thing, uh, or getting onto our book face. I mean Facebook or Twitter. So, you know, on Facebook, we are Cat5TV. On Twitter, we are Category5TV. Um, so if you follow these or get onto our Discord, which is available on our website, if you click on Interact and uh, you go to Category5.TV is our main website. So these are all different ways that you can kind of follow along with the show, what's going on. Because the next few weeks are going to be weird. They're going to be really, really weird. I have consistently been about consistency. I am very keen on making sure that we do a show every week, but what I've realized through the course of season 13, lucky 13, 2020 we'll call it, dun dun dun! Well, I've realized that, you know, I'm just one guy and I do a show for you uh, through the interwebs and uh, sometimes I need a little bit more time to get everything together. So what's happening is that as we transition into season 14, there is going to be a short break and that short break is going to allow me, my, my staff, my team, the opportunity to get everything set up the way that we want to be for season 14. And that means putting all 2020 behind us, even though it'll still be 2020. Don't you worry. I'm not talking next year. I'm talking next month. So we're going to put it all behind us and we're going to say, look, we are strong. We are stronger than ever. And thanks to our community who have carried us through this time, we're going to make it through. And we have. So now it's just putting our, you know, the elbow grease in and getting the final touches done up. So when I come in every Wednesday to do Category 5 Technology TV Live, it's a mad dash to get everything wired up, everything set up, and everything ready. We record the news, we put together Crypto Corner with Robert Koenig, and I get all those files prepared and we're ready to go out the gate and then, you know, a microphone doesn't work or some crazy thing like that. So all of these things need to be worked through before we kick off season 14. So again, get involved in our community, get involved in the various chat um, areas like the IRC or Discord. 
Following us on Twitter or Facebook is a great way to be kept up to date as to uh, what's going on and when we will be live, or just go to our website, category5.tv, and I will endeavor to keep the calendar up to date, which if you scroll down on that main, uh, main page, you're going to see a, a Google Calendar embed, and that's going to show you what is coming up. So I want to say, hey... Hey to our Discord, I see you all. I see BP9 and Solboo and Marshman and Ubu and HJ. Thanks. Good sound tonight, they say. That is fantastic. What a difference a week can make. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it is so nice to see everybody. My Ordix is joining us as well. Nice to see you. Nomen5. And our Discord is a great way to interact, not just with our staff, but also the community themselves, and they'll probably be up to date on what's going on. Um, speaking of community, also there is some transitioning going on with the community coffee break as that kind of winds down its original intention. It is becoming its own kind of separate community uh, event that we're going to be holding hopefully every week uh, as we have done in the past. So keep an eye on our website. Uh, everything is so up in the air during the time of transition, folks. I'm going to call it that, the time of transition. And uh, we're, we're kind of evolving into what everything is going to be come mid-October-ish. So keep an eye on our website. You're going to be kept up to date. But I do believe uh, there will be a Category 5 Community Coffee Break this coming Sunday at noon. If all goes well from a technical standpoint, it should be there. I will be posting links on our homepage and making sure that you're ready to go. All right. I have my Pinebook Pro this, my friends, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move this out of the way. We're going to save this for later. I know you want to see what's in the box, but I'm going to just set that right there. I have my Pinebook Pro. This sleek little machine is absolutely stunning. Look at the, like, do you, do you get the sense for how lightweight this is? Ooh, for how sleek and slimline it is. One of the other things is there are no moving parts. That means no fans, no active cooling. There is therefore no noise, none. Have you ever held a laptop on your lap that generates absolutely zero noise? That's the Pinebook Pro. The only reason I have it plugged in right now is so that I can bring up its screen for you. That's the only reason. Otherwise, it's completely wireless. Um, I get about six hours battery life on this thing on a single charge. And there are some hacky little things that you learn about your Pinebook Pro as you go. So I'm going to tell you one of those. I lost my power adapter. I lost my little barrel plug to be able to charge it. And I was like, what am I going to do? And then I got into the forum and there were people in the chat speaking about the ability to charge it with USB-C. So I thought, what? Wait a minute. So, um, so I started looking through the thread and Wukash, who has been on our show, was uh, talking about the fact that yes, with a standard phone charger, you can plug USB-C into the Pinebook Pro and charge it. So I thought, that's crazy. I'm using USB-C for HDMI output. But you're saying I can plug in an HD, uh, a USB-C power adapter and that's going to charge my Pinebook Pro? So I took the risk. The risk, I mean, Wukash Arakinski was in the forum saying, uh, you, you know, he's from Pine64 and giving the thumbs up and saying, yeah, you can use your USB-C phone charger. So I did it and it charged quickly. Very, very impressed. So that's one little hacky thing that I didn't realize out of the box I could do with my Pine, Pinebook Pro. I thought I had to have that adapter. I'm sure I'll find it somewhere and I'll be like, what is this for? I don't need this anymore. But one of the other things that you can hack on a Pinebook Pro is the operating system. Now understand this little guy, as sleek as it is, as beautiful as this is as a laptop, it is, I'll call it a developer system. 
So where something that is this sleek and this powerful would, you know, maybe you would expect to pay six, eight hundred bucks, um, 10,000 if it's an Apple product. Uh, with this, it's only 200 bucks. So what do you get for 200 bucks? I mean, that's the temptation is, oh, wow, a $200 Linux laptop. It's so sleek and it's so great. And it is. But I want to be clear that the Pinebook Pro is not for your average everyday user. It's for the tinkerer. It's for the people who, like me, want to be able to find hacky little things and build my own operating system and figure out how to make things work. And it's, a, it's really a development platform laptop. It's amazing for programmers. I mean, I program in Bosch all the time. Uh, I'm also a PHP developer who uses Nano as my IDE. So, you know, like I, I love this kind of form factor and this lightweight, long battery life, but it's not for my kids because they can't you know it's not a gaming system it's not meant for that and it's they're they're going to it's going to lead to disappointment so if you're looking at the pinebook pro we need to look at it with that kind of just going into it you need to understand that it's not the same as the $3000 laptop or the $2000 laptop or the $1000 laptop this is basically the power of a really good high end chromebook but with genuine linux on it but it is open source and it's continually growing. So um, right now you may install an operating system and find it's a little buggy or you've got problems with this or that, but then it'll get better and better or you try a different distro and because it's open source, you will find, you know, maybe you'll find one that you'll love. But I wanna, you know, I hope that that's clear because I don't ever want you to go out and buy something like this, a Pinebook Pro, and then be disappointed. I am very impressed by contrast. But the average Joe user, somebody who's not a computer guru or, you know, you don't have to be a guru, don't get me wrong, but you've got to want to tinker. You have to have that desire to mess around and, and play with it. If you don't have that desire, then maybe the Pinebook Pro isn't for you. Um, and so I want to give that to you up front because I don't want you to be disappointed with that purchase. If you love to tinker, if you're like me, you love to hack and, and program and get into the Linux terminal and compile things yourself, this is probably for you. It's got a 1080p screen. It's, again, super, super sleek. Great battery life. It's got 802, 11, uh, 5 gigahertz. So I had to be like A, C, N, G, B. I don't know. It's got it's got five 2.4 gigahertz Bluetooth and everything else. But again, like it's it is what it is, and it's fantastic for what it is. So as I seek to kind of customize my Pinebook Pro, it came with Manjaro Linux, and I love what the Manjaro team are doing with the Pinebook Pro. Again, it's open source, right? So so this team is creating a distro that Pine64 has said, okay, well, this is probably the most rock solid right now, so let's put that on as our default. And so that's what they're doing. Um, but I'm not an ARC fan, and that's what it's based on, and, and I am very much a Debian fan. So Debian can be any derivative of Debian, so that can be Ubuntu. On my desktop computer, my production computer, I'm actually using Linux Mint, which, as I understand it, is based on Ubuntu, and Ubuntu is based on Debian. So it all comes down to, for me, loving the Debian distro. Uh, so my servers run Debian pure, and I wanted to, I wanted to seek out being able to install Debian on my Pinebook Pro, like legit Debian. And then, lo and behold, community member Daniel Thompson got in there and uploaded a script that allows you to compile upstream Debian 11 on your Pinebook Pro. So that means that it is Debian as if it was Debian downloaded from Debian.org, essentially. There's a couple of tweaks there with the kernel and things like that, and Daniel's done a really, really great job of making it really, really easy to do and really, really easy to get through. But uh, it is bullseye at its heart, so you're ending up with a true Debian operating system on your Pinebook Pro. Well, why would you want that other than just 
the bragging rights to say, hey, I compiled my own operating system. So I'm talking like you're not taking an image and flashing it to the EMMC. No, we're actually creating the image ourselves. Well, why would you do that other than the bragging rights? There is that. But when you download an operating system, Manjaro, or any other distro, you're basically taking what the distro developers have said, this is what we like, or this is what we want our distro to look like and feel like and act like. These are the, the included pieces of software that we want in our distro, and that's what's included. So when you install a true base raw Debian upstream um, distro, you are getting um, basically just a, a bare shell that you can now decide. How do I want it to look? How do I want it to function? What office suite do I want? What browser do I want? I get to choose all of those things. So how easy can it be? Well, all you need is, now I'm running from my micro SD on my Pinebook Pro. So I need an SD card because if I'm running from, uh, pardon me, I'm running from the EMMC. So if I'm running from the EMMC, I can, create my image on an SD card, a micro SD. If I'm running my operating system from the micro SD, I can similarly create the image on my, um, on my EMMC internally. So I don't actually have to take that chip out. That's pretty cool. So all you need to do is just insert your micro SD card into the side of your Pinebook Pro. And just give it a little push and now the first thing that happens is these windows will pop up for the partitions. Just make sure you eject those, all right? So we want to basically unmount those so that they're not actually mounted on our, uh, on our operating system. And then I'm gonna go into applications, internet, and Firefox on my system. Whatever browser you're using, that's fine. Chrome, whatever. And I've made a little shortcut for you, cat5.tv slash pbpdeb. And that's gonna take you to this page by Daniel Thompson uh, that has a link to, well, it's got some great information about any bugs that are outstanding, things that you can come to expect from this build, but it's got the link to the GitHub repository. So let's copy that by right-clicking and copy the link location. And then we're gonna jump into our terminal. So on my system here, it's System Tools Mate Terminal. And Git clone is going to clone that repository and, and then paste that link. Uh, but I haven't installed Git yet. So sudo apt install Git and just enter your password. That's going to install the Git um, program to be able to synchronize our Git repositories and download this uh, installer script. So now just run that again, Git clone and then the paste. And now go into the folder, Pinebook Pro Debian installer and sudo dot slash install dash Debian is all we need to run. So hit enter. So now it's actually going through and get cloning all kinds of stuff um, directly from the repositories that, uh, that, uh, that Daniel has set up. So let's just let that go. And for the most part, I'm gonna do this in real time. I'm gonna speed it up a little bit for you just because, hey, this is TV and I don't want it to be, you know, 45 minutes of just watching a compiler on an ARM processor. Um, let's see here. So this is now creating the file system on my drive. That's the SD card. Now you see unable to resolve host Robbie dash PBP. Do not worry about that. That is my distro. I'm missing the host entry for uh, one nine, uh, sorry to be uh, 127.0.1.1 should resolve to Robbie dash PBP, but I haven't added that entry to my host file yet. So just keep that in mind. That is not an error. That is just a host entry that is missing from my host file. So this goes through. You can see there, there's really no questions here. It's just going through, doing its thing. It's installing all the components for Debian and getting our base installed. There you go. I see Bash. I see Calendar. I see NCAL and BusyBox. Look at that. All right, so now we need to enter a host name. So I'm going to call this Pinebook. Pro, you can call it whatever you want. Uh, and then create your user. I'm gonna use Robbie and enter a password to create that user. So this is what I'm gonna use to log into my computer. Enter your name if you want. 
And this is just the typical uh, user creation process on Linux. Say that's correct and let her go. So that's now uh, installed and, and ready to go. So now I got to go through like the keyboard setup. This is all pretty straightforward. You've seen this before. I'm selecting the US keyboard layout and the default. I don't want to mess with that. And no compose key is fine. Now, this is very important. Make sure you select your locale. This does not include any locales out of the box. So I'm going to scroll down to EN uh, US UTF 8 and hit space to include that and then tab and OK. If you don't include a locale, you're going to have some missing language support um, and make sure you set it as the default as well. OK, that is very, very important. Uh, all right. Wait for it. Here it goes. All right, we generated our locale. Now it's asking us for our time zone. Standard Debian installer, right? So I'm going America and we'll go down to Toronto, hit T. There we go. Toronto, America. And this is very important. Now this is pretty cool. You can select what desktop environment you want. Now, first of all, I wanna say I jumped on Twitter and I let you decide. So I said, let's pretend I'm going to install Debian on a Pine64 Pinebook Pro tonight on live TV. Which desktop environment do you want to see me install? From 311 votes, 11% said LXDE. LXDE is a very lightweight uh, desktop environment. So if you want incredible performance, it's probably going to work really, really well. It has a similar kind of interface to like Windows 98, um, but a little bit streamlined, not quite as many features as Mate, um, but it runs really, really fast and doesn't take a lot of system resources. 18% of folks said they want to see me install Mate. I love Mate. That's what I'm actually running normally on my Pinebook Pro. That's what I run on my um, on my Linux Mint system. I use the Mate version. And anytime I install Ubuntu, guess which version I install? Zubuntu. No, I'm just kidding. It's Ubuntu Mate. Uh, Thirty-two percent. Speaking of Ubuntu, uh, thirty-two percent of our Twitter uh, poll uh, respondents voted for XFCE maybe even more lightweight than LXDE, but a, le a little less m like the paradigm of that kind of Windows operating system. I'm going to use that as like my example for the paradigm. But you know, like the start menu, the applications menu of LXDE and Mate, XFCE is a little bit different. You kind of right click on things and bring up uh, pop up dialogues by doing it that way. And 39% for the win said they want to see me install Gnome. Gnome. It's like a Klingon word. It needs an apostrophe after the G. So Gnome is quite the contrast to LXDE. It's heavy. It's, it's, pr it's pretty heavy. I'm going to put that on a $200 Pinebook Pro. Are you sure? Is this to challenge Robbie and see if this will work? Well, let's go through. So I'm going to select Debian desktop environment followed by what? Gnome. You can install multiple if you want, and then you can select it at, uh, at your profile selection. And then I'm going to select laptop. That's just going to install some tools like my battery manager and things like that and hit OK. And here we go. Thank you to everyone who responded to my Twitter poll. 311 people voted, and 39% of those voted for GNOME. So we're going to see how that performs on a Pinebook Pro. This is going to take a little bit of time. There's really no more interaction required at this point. It's just going to go, and it's just going to install. Remember, I'm installing to my uh, micro SD card right now. Uh, I could then, from the micro SD card, turn around and install by doing the same process to my eMMC, and now I've done it without having to open up the Pinebook Pro. So when we come back from this short break, this whole process will be complete, the installer will be finished, and I'm going to fire up my Pinebook Pro in the shiny new 
GNOME desktop environment using Debian 11 Upstart. Stick around. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV, and today we're looking at GNOME on the Pinebook Pro $200 Pine64 Linux laptop. And it worked! I can't believe that here we are in GNOME, and it's running, at least. Now, first quick question from our chat is, BP9 wants to see me open a terminal and drag it around on the screen just to see what the performance is like. Oh, I just maximized it. Unmaximized. All right, let's see. Uh, my mouse seems odd. There we go. All right, so there I am moving it around. Apparently I'm in like left-handed mode on the mouse though. That's strange. So let's see if there's a quick way to fix that. It's a little bit slow too, so I might want to accelerate the mouse. Um, so let's see if I can just like turn it up a bit. There we go. I'm using the touchpad, so it seems a little janky out the box. So you can kind of see what I'm talking about, how, hey, maybe you gotta kind of play around with things a little bit, and I'm doing this on the fly. Oh, that feels a lot better. Okay, is there a way real quick, does anyone know, to reverse? Oh, okay, there we are, primary button. Left, yes! Does that fix it? That's just maybe no, maybe I'm not used to GNOME. Do you right click to move things? But there you go. Hey, performance is all right of that. Okay, click. We got Firefox. What else have we got? Let's check out the apps. Performance looks like graphic performance. You got to admit. That's pretty sleek for GNOME on a Pinebook Pro. Holy cow. Got to get used to the mouse though. I, I'm going to want to tweak that. And right out of the box, here I am and thinking, you know, there are some things that I would want to tweak for sure. I don't have Wi-Fi, so I can't bring up the internet to show you uh, the internet just now. But obviously we've got Firefox. Hey, play with this. This is just a really quick demonstration to see, hey, can we compile Debian Linux upstream on a Pinebook Pro, and does it perform? This is performing really well. Yeah, I know. Look at that. So we've got LibreOffice Writer, LibreOffice Suite already pre-installed out the box, and you can bring up Synaptic Package Manager, I presume is included, yes. Synaptic Package Manager is a place, oh, it's not in installed. I can, so it actually took me to the installer to install it. That works for me. So hey, with Synaptic Package Manager, I can install things, but it looks like it's got its own crazy package installer too. I admit, not a gnome baby. I'm a Mate baby. So I'm old school. So those of you who know gnome are like, that's this and that and yeah. So, but hey, it works out the box. Very cool. So why do I want to do that? Because I want control over my environment, over my Pinebook Pro. I want to be able to control it. Am I going to run GNOME on it myself? No. Am I going to run Mate? Yeah, that's my choice. But it goes to show how if 39% of our community who responded said, I want GNOME, that's not my choice. But it goes to show that, hey, you can customize this, make it the way you want your Pinebook Pro to be, and it gives you that opportunity to really play around and make it your own. And then you can copy it, DD it to the SD card or onto the, you know, make a backup, and then you've got your own distro that you can flash onto it, um, reinstall if you need to, if you break something, and all that kind of stuff. So that is a fun project. Don't forget, I set up that quick link for you at cat5.com 
Live.tv slash PBPDeb, and that will take you right to Daniel Thompson's repository, the information there about the script that he's created. Big shout out and kudos to Daniel for submitting that to the community. That is a big thumbs up from Category 5. Thank you, everybody. I uh, hope you enjoy your Pinebook Pro, and we've got to jump over to the newsroom. So here is Becca. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. UK-based computer chip designer Arm Holdings is being sold to the American graphics chip specialist NVIDIA. Microsoft's underwater data center has resurfaced after two years. A deep learning model has achieved superhuman performance at Gran Turismo Sport. Microsoft has submitted Linux kernel patches for a complete virtualization stack with Linux and Hyper-V. And Google says it has wiped out its entire carbon footprint, past and present. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. UK-based computer chip designer Arm Holdings is being sold to the American graphics chip specialist NVIDIA. The deal values Arm at $40 billion four years after it was bought by Japanese conglomerate SoftBank for $32 billion. Arm creates computer chip designs that others then customize to their own ends. It also develops instruction sets which define how software controls processors. ARM's technology is at the heart of most smartphones, among many other devices, including a majority of single-board computers such as the Raspberry Pi, Odroid XU4, or Rock Pro 64, which also makes it the heart of Pine 64's Pinebook Pro. ARM will also power Apple's new MacBook lineup. NVIDIA has promised to keep the business based in the UK to hire more staff and to retain ARM's brand. It added that the deal would create the premier computing company for the age of artificial intelligence. California headquartered NVIDIA overtook Intel to become the world's most valuable chip maker in July. Until now, it is specialized in high-end graphics processing units. These are commonly used by gamers to deliver more detailed visuals, as well as by professionals for tasks, including scientific research, machine learning, and cryptocurrency mining. In our case, we render all our video in real time using NVIDIA's CUDA platform. NVIDIA is also one of ARM's clients, using its designs to create its lineup of Tegra central processing units. Under the terms of the deal, NVIDIA will pay SoftBank $21.5 billion in its own stock and $12 billion in cash. It will follow up to a further $5 billion in cash or stock if certain targets are met. NVIDIA will also issue $1.5 billion in equity to ARM's employees. Two years ago, Microsoft sank a data center off the coast of Orkney in a wild experiment. That data center has now been retrieved from the ocean floor, and Microsoft researchers are assessing how it has performed and what they can learn from it about energy efficiency. Their first conclusion is that the cylinder packed with servers had a lower failure rate than a conventional data center. When the container was hauled off the seabed around half a mile offshore after being placed there in May 2018, just 8 out of the 855 servers on board had failed. That compares very well with a conventional data center. Ben Cutler, who has led Microsoft's Project Natick, says, Our failure rate in the water is one-eighth of what we see on land. The team is speculating that the greater reliability may be connected to the fact that there were no humans on board, and that nitrogen rather than oxygen was pumped into the capsule. Mr. Cutler says the nitrogen atmosphere reduces corrosion and is cool, plus the absence of humans aboard. With the absence of humans aboard, it means there's no movement or things being banged around. Orkney was chosen for the trial by Microsoft partly because it was a center for renewable energy research in a place where the climate was temperate, perhaps even chilly. The idea was that the cost of cooling computers would be lower if they were underwater. The white cylinder emerged from the cold waters with a coating of algae and barnacles after a day-long operation. But inside, the data center was still functioning well and is now being closely examined so that the research team can learn more. Project Natick was 
was uh, partly about working out whether clusters of small underwater data centers for short-term use might be a commercial proposition, but also an attempt to learn broader lessons about energy efficiency in cloud computing. The overarching goal of Project Natick is to evaluate the feasibility of underwater data centers. Phase one was just to be able to figure out, can we get computers into a container and can we deploy them in the water without it leaking and do the computers survive and how well do they last? Phase two was to show that we can make it in a manufacturable uh, production scale component. So the container behind me, it fits, on an, uh, it fits on a trailer, it fits on a cargo ship, and it, it allows us to actually build up this data center to any size that we want. Orkney is a great place for this partnership because they've got renewable energy for 100% and more of their grid power. Computers are not designed to work in the environment that we humans operate. So things like oxygen, moisture in the air, that is really bad for computers. It, it causes corrosion on the components. Uh, you also get temperature fluctuations. So the heat from night to day and summer to winter can cause those components to fail. And so we had this theory that if we're in a really stable environment, we're in this cylinder, we've taken all the oxygen out, we've controlled the humidity, no one's walking around, there's no, nobody bumping things or causing any additional failures that we'd see better reliability. This project gives us the ability to feel like we're working not just on computers, not just on data centers, but on uh, sort of moving forward environmental responsibility as a company and as individuals. I mean, everybody uses the cloud. Everybody needs data centers. This, this need isn't going to go away. We're going to continue to build larger data centers and use more electricity because the demand is there and the demand keeps growing. But how can we do it that's better for the environment and that's just better for us as a people? The experiment on Orkney is over, but the hope is that the result will be more environmentally friendly data storage, both on land and underwater. Microsoft is cautious about saying when an underwater data center might be a commercial product, but is confident that it has proved the idea has value. A deep learning model has achieved superhuman performance at Gran Turismo Sport. Over the past few decades, research teams worldwide have developed machine learning and deep learning techniques that can achieve human comparable performance on a variety of tasks. In order to further assess their capabilities and performances, some of these models were also trained to play renowned board or video games such as the ancient Chinese game Go or Atari arcade games. Researchers at University of Zurich and Sony AI Zurich have recently tested the performance of a deep reinforcement learning-based approach that was trained to play the car racing video game Gran Turismo Sport. Their findings further highlight the potential of deep learning techniques for controlling cars in simulated environments. Yan Long Song, one of the researchers who carried out the study, says, Autonomous driving at high speed is a challenging task that requires generating fast and precise actions even when the vehicle is approaching its physical limits. Autonomous car racing, where the goal is to complete a given course in minimal time, features some of these difficulties of controlling a car close to its physical limitations. To address these challenges and advance the frontier, we consider the task of autonomous car racing in the top-selling car racing game, Gran Turismo Sport, which is known for its detailed physics simulation of various cars and tracks. The key objective of the study is to develop an artificial neural network-based controller that can autonomously navigate a race car within a simulated track without requiring any prior knowledge of the car's dynamics. To perform well at Gran Turismo Sport, the controller should be trying to minimize the amount of time in which it can complete a given tra uh, track. The researchers first defined a reward function that formulated the racing problem as a minimum time problem, as well as outlining a neural network policy that directly mapped input observations to car control commands. Subsequently, they trained their neural network's parameters using reinforcement learning, maximizing the reward that their model would receive when, re when performing well. The researchers trained the neural network on four PlayStation 4s and a desktop PC. Remarkably, after less than 73 hours of training, their model had already achieved superhuman performance, outperforming the best known human lap times in all three reference settings, including two different cars on two different tracks.
The results highlight the incredible level of precision that the model can achieve and its ability to consistently execute optimal actions, even in scenarios where these actions are risky and might lead a human player to push their car off track. So what exactly would you reward an AI with? Chips? What I really love about this story that Becca is sharing with us is that when I think about AI technology up until this point, when it comes to that machine learning, it's very like step based. So you think about chess, for example. So when an AI plays chess, it's planning out the next move and then it makes that move and then it plans out the next move and then it makes that move. What's happening here in Gran Turismo Sport is that the AI, the machine learning algorithm, the, the brains of the operation has to continually be planning ahead and figuring out how to make those moves. And, and it does it so very well. So it makes me think, okay, first of all, this could be a really, really great way to improve the computer players in online games or in offline games. Imagine being able like, to, to play a race car game with opponents that match your level of skill and maybe even surpass it. But by using those computer games as simulations, they're training the AI even further to learn what works in a simulated environment where human lives are never at risk. So would they then be able to take that learned methodology, that learned intelligence, if you will, and move it over to true autonomous vehicles that are going to operate on the road and are able to basically think for themselves and plan how are they going to pass a car without actually hitting that car. And those kinds of things that right now we're just not quite there yet with autonomous vehicles. But could this be kind of a precursor to the next step? of artificial intelligence based uh, autonomous vehicles. And then that leads to everything else. I think about space flight and, and everything that is to come. It's really an exciting time. Hey, we've got to take a really quick break though. Uh, Microsoft has actually submitted Linux kernel patches for a complete virtualization stack with Linux and Hyper-V. And Google says that it has wiped out its entire carbon footprint, both past and present. Becca has these stories coming up, plus Robert is here with the Crypto Corner, so don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the world of cryptos and welcome back to the Crypto Corner. I hope you had a fantastic week and as you know, there's always something exciting happening in crypto. So let's take a look into it. The market has recovered a little bit. Um, it's not at the 400 billion US dollar we had uh, almost two weeks ago before the correction, but it's recovering nicely. And as you can see, uh, we see a lot of green um, in, uh, in the market cap. But if we sort after our seven days, we see the usual picture, DeFi, 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 and so on and so on. And if we sort it by the negative, uh, it's similar also, DeFi, DeFi, DeFi. And so we get a lot of questions in regards to uh, DeFi, uh, as one can imagine. And I'd like to dive a little bit into how to be safe when investing in this famous yield farming uh, market. So let's take a look into that. You probably saw this tool here from me last time uh, we spoke about this here, yieldfarmingtools.com, which lists not all of them, but some of those uh, yield farming uh, uh, opportunities that are out there. And I explained in the last video why an APR of 889% is possible. And if you click on this uh, option here, then you see that the smart contract risk level is high and the impermanent loss level is high. And so I explained to you that smart contract, that's something that you can check by going into defisafety.com. That will explain to you which protocol is safe and which one isn't. So if it's something in red, I would definitely not touch that. If it's green, then yes, it has been audited and it's probably safe. 
The other thing is the impermanent loss. And to explain how that one works, because everybody has got a question, what is impermanent loss? Just those two words are really weird anyway. So if we look at the traditional market, yeah, like here I pulled up Binance uh, with XEM and BTC, uh, then you see here that you've got the order book. People want to sell and people that want to buy and in the middle somewhere they find the mutual price that acceptable but you've got people that have got different price views and they're just willing to wait or not wait. And that's not the case in um, protocols like Uniswap. As you probably saw in Uniswap you don't have an order book and the way that that's set up is explained through this chart here. So at the beginning, when you build up a pool in Uniswap, you decide how many Ether, and in this case, how many DAI you're putting into the pool. And that's the ratio that's fixed. And so, of course, the prices are changing. And if the prices are changing a little bit, it's no problem. But if the ch prices are changing a lot, it is a problem. And that's called impermanent loss. And what I've done here for you is um, I set up a calculation, so an Excel spreadsheet. So you can see here, for example, when we uh, have got a protocol, uh, Ethereum and Sushi, um, yeah, so a pool, we provide liquidity for a pool, Ethereum and Sushi, the price when we open that pool is 386 and uh, the Sushi price is 504. And uh, today the price went down a little bit in Ethereum, it's now 375.65. And sushi are left here at 504. So the impairment loss is about 0%. In other words, you have not lost any of your money. But if this price changes significantly, then at the moment it's, our, it's around $3, then there's an impairment loss of 2.9%. So you lost 2.9% of your assets in this, in this case. If we make that difference bigger, so let's say, say, that this is not 3, this is uh, 0, uh, 0.4, uh, then you see you lost 47.2%. It's not that you lost the sushi part of your portfolio, because remember, there's always this balance. Uh, you lost 47% of your whole pool. So the good money, that in this case Ethereum, that stayed stable, you lost 47% of that one too. And that's the risk that you're carrying here. And that's a problem with all these DeFi protocols, like here, Moon, which is another similar to Sushi, you have got an APY of 3,000%. Sounds fantastic. But have you checked the, the, the Moon price? Yeah, so let's do that. We, if we go into here and say Moon, then you'll see the risk that you're carrying by just investing in this pool. Yeah, so let's go 14 days. So at one stage it was 12 and now it's around 2.90. So you will have lost significantly amount, whether it's go up or down, doesn't matter. It's always the relationship, the relation that is important. So you will have lost a lot of money by investing in this pool. And that's exactly the risk that you're carrying, uh, which is called uh, in, in permanent loss. Yeah, so that's where you have to be really careful. You have to check if you invest in one of those crazy pools, you have to be really on top of that and check it every hour, even during the night, <coughs> that the price doesn't change. Because you know, in cryptos, those prices can change in a second. So I hope you understood what um, a permanent loss is and how risky that is if you invest in these coins. And they all are risky. So there is not one where you can say um, that this is a safe bet and you'll get your 199%. Just do the calculation. This formula that I had here, in this uh, spreadsheet uh, is is available and uh, if not just send us an email and we'll send uh, the spreadsheet to you um, but anyway so that's it from me this week again i hope you enjoyed it i hope you learned something um, this is the, the solution to the impermanent loss or the answer to the question what's impermanent loss and uh, yeah i wish you a fantastic week and thank you very much for watching and i'm looking forward to see you next week again Thank you. Bye-bye. Now, I can't pretend to know cryptocurrency in the marketplace as well as Robert Koenig, but if you're like me, you're probably craving sitting down on the moon with some sushi right about now. That is crypto correspondent Robert Koenig. Robert, thank you so much. Just a reminder that we're not providing financial advice, but only sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency marketplace. 
always remember that the cryptocurrency markets are ever-changing and they're always volatile. They never close. You should only spend what you can afford to lose. Now back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. Microsoft has submitted a series of patches to the Linux kernel with its aim being to create a complete virtualization stack with Linux and Microsoft hypervisor. The patches are designated RFC, Request for Comments, and are a minimal implementation presented for discussion. The key change is that with the patched kernel, Linux will run as the Hyper-V root partition. In the Hyper-V architecture, the root partition has direct access to hardware and creates child partitions for the virtual machines it hosts. Microsoft principal software engineer Wei Liu says, just think of it like Zen's DOM0. Hyper-V's architecture is more similar to Zen than it is to KVM or to ESXi, and Liu acknowledged that they in fact draw inspiration from the Zen code in Linux. Until now, the Hyper-V root partition had to run Windows. Microsoft has also ported Intel's open source cloud hypervisor, a virtual machine monitor that normally runs on KVM, which is built into the Linux kernel. With these changes, Microsoft likely has its Azure cloud infrastructure in mind. Azure runs more Linux than Windows, as acknowledged back in July 2019 by Microsoft engineer Sasha Levin, who said, The Linux usage on our cloud has surpassed Windows. Linux already runs well on Hyper-V with a Windows root partition, but making this a complete Linux stack may improve performance. Microsoft is also working hard to improve Linux support in Windows 10 with SL, uh, S, or, sorry, WSL2, and they even ship a Linux kernel with Windows. GUI support has been promised. WSL2 also uses Hyper-V, and Windows 10 is on a path to becoming a hybrid Windows slash Linux system, though as of now, this is mainly of interest to developers. Microsoft's Ignite virtual conference is taking place next week, and we can expect the company to say more about its Linux plans then. Google says it has wiped out its entire carbon footprint by investing in high-quality carbon offsets. It became carbon neutral in 2007 and says it now has compensated for all of the carbon it has ever created. Chief Executive Sundar Pakai has also announced that they intend to run all of their data centers and offices on carbon-free energy by 2030. They'll do things like pair wind and solar power sources together and increase the use of battery storage, and Pakai says they're working on ways to apply artificial intelligence to further optimize their electricity demand and forecasting. While carbon neutrality demands a certain level of scrutiny, the fact remains it is becoming fashionable for large companies to work towards sustainability, reducing their own impact on the environment. Microsoft, for example, revealed plans to become carbon negative by 2030 back in January, and both Apple and Amazon have plans to become carbon neutral in the next 10 to 20 years. Google's Endeavor will also create around 12,000 jobs over the next five years. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what, appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. In the Category 5.tv newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Welcome back. This is Category 5 Technology TV. But we're not doing tech, because sometimes what we feature here on the show isn't necessarily tech. Sometimes the things that we feature are just things that we think are cool. Here in our studio, I mean, we've got to decorate, right? And on the bridge, I wanted an Orville model. And sure enough, we got one. 
Eagle Moss uh, is selling these right now. You can go to cat5.tv slash Orville model, and that's not an affiliate link or anything. It's just so that it's really easy for you to get to the website where they're selling it. There are two different versions of this. There's a 10 point some odd inch version and then a five point some odd inch. So basically half size and then the full size, the XL, which is what I'm about to unbox. So I had to, here in Canada, call up a local um, comic book store because they wouldn't ship it from the website to us here in Canada. So I wanna tell you, if you're unable to order it direct, give a call to your local uh, comic book store. I called Big B Comics here in Barrie, Ontario, Canada, and they were incredibly helpful. They told me that it would probably ship around October 31st, and here I am, it's September 16th, and I already have it. So it's way ahead of schedule, and I don't know if they did that on purpose just to impress me, but I'm impressed and very, very happy. So just an encouragement that if you can't get your hands on one of these and you want to, make sure you give a call to your local um, comic book store because they're able to pull it off of their order list. Again, I've got that hot link for you for Eagle Moss at cat5.tv slash Orville model. But let's get in here. First of all, the box says ECV197 Orville. The USS Orville was designed to explore great distances and map uncharted space. While the ship is an example of the superior technology of the year 2418, its ragtag crew are a little less advanced. Nice little summary there of the Orville. Let's get into the box. So this is a die-cast model from Eagle Moss, the official ship's collection with the Orville. Here we are. Okay, so it starts out with a 16-page color booklet. It's got the design specs, ship profile, uh, write up about the ship, uh, exploratory class vessel, USS Orville investigates the mysteries of the Alpha Quadrant. It's got some great pictures from the show. Nicely printed. Nice little keepsake there. That's a little bonus. Cool. All right, so let's get into the box and see what do we have here. Oh. Before I get right in here, remember back on episode number 628, Tom Costantino and Brooke Noska showed us a $400,000 model of the Orville ship. There you oh, go. Here we go. Oh my goodness. <gasps> so this is the actual model, folks, that was, uh, that was used to shoot those. Uh... $400,000 worth of fun, kids. Wow. That's... Well, this one is a little bit less expensive and will fit on your desk. It's only 75 bucks for the XL, about 30 for the small one. And there we are. Wow. I am such a geek. I have this shirt. I mean, come on. And I didn't even have to buy this special, you know? Okay, so here we've got a base. It's just a black base. I have seen some pictures on Twitter uh, with a glass base, and I really, really love that idea, but I haven't been able to find it. So I think that that might have been like a custom base that was like for maybe for Tom or something like that. So that just kind of snaps together, presumably. And into the box. It's cold. The metal, because it's a die cast model, the metal is actually, you can feel that it is a metal model. That's cool. It's got metal parts. Now I can feel these are plastic. I want to call them nacelles. We're going to call them engine loops. The lower two are plastic, and the top one is metal part of the die cast. So this is uh, the cast model here, and then the attachments are the lower two engine loops. And there you are. ECV197 from cat5.tv slash Orville model. Again, that's just to get you there really, really quickly. And there you have it. That's going to go on our bridge as a little ornament and a little bit of a um, homage to Tom and Brooke and everyone else who put the show together. And uh, that will represent on our, uh, on our bridge. There you have it. Beautiful. Very nice. Well, folks, it's been really nice having you here. Thank you for joining me for season 13, which has been an absolute nightmare, but we made it through. 
And you know what? Category 5 is stronger than ever. It really is. Um, but we have these growing pains here as we are in a new studio space and working our way toward um, basically being ready for season 14. So I'm very much looking forward to season 14. I've got a lot of stuff planned out. Uh, just a reminder, if you are a supporter from our Kickstarter campaign or if you are a supporter currently on Patreon, you will receive some vlogs over the course of the next few weeks as we'll be showing you what is actually happening behind the scenes leading up to Season 14. If you're not currently a part of our Patreon page, you can join that at any time and you're not missing out because if you join today, you're able to actually watch the previous 114 vlogs. Um, the most recent vlog is here at Studio E, me setting things up, getting the uh, acoustic tiles in, steaming drapes and talking about all the things that are to come, putting some LEDs behind a TV to make it look cool, and that's a full half hour of behind the scenes video hosted by me right here at the studio. So if you're a fan of the show, please support us on Patreon patreon.com slash category five and you're going to have access not only to those past vlogs but also everything that's going to be coming in the coming weeks to show you our supporters what's going on behind the scenes thank you so much for carrying category five through this difficult time i know it's been a challenging time for all of us uh, but it could have gone all sorts of ways for category five and i know that in season 14 we're going to be strong possibly stronger than ever. We've got a great space, we've got a great backing, and we've got a great team. And I'm really looking forward to bringing you the show in October. Keep up to date, folks. I will see you soon. Check in on the Discord, I'll be there. Take it easy. Good night.